What's up everyone? Today's video we're going to be talking about the easiest and most effective way to be describing your wine. So today we're going to be learning about the structural components of the wine and how to use those to effectively describe any wine that you're tasting. So the five structural components that go into every single wine are as follows. We have the dryness of the wine, the body of the wine, the alcohol content, the acidity, and finally we have the tannins as well. Now, the dryness of the wine is the easiest structural component to describe. Basically it's saying, is this wine sweet or does it not taste sweet? Now, if it doesn't taste sweet, we're gonna call that wine dry. If it tastes kind of sweet, we're gonna call that wine off dry. That's it, that's the dryness. Dryness is one of the most misused words when it comes to describing wine because a lot of people use it to describe some sort of mouth sensation, some sort of astringency or drying out. That's not what it's used for. Keep it simple, remember this. Dryness means the wine is not sweet. Off dry means the wine has a little bit of sweetness. Now, second component of the structure of the wine is the body of the wine. Basically, the body of the wine is how heavy it feels in your mouth. It's kind of related to the viscosity of the wine. And there's a lot of neat tricks to help you easily to tell if the wine's light, medium, or full-bodied. So I've got a couple props here. We've got some water in a glass, we've got some milk in a glass, and those are used to illustrate the difference in body that uh, that a lot of different wines will have as well. So the water is going to be a kind of extreme example for a very light bodied wine. So notice how one, it's totally translucent and clear. Uh, if you tilt the glass and you look at your fingers underneath, obviously since it's water, you'll be able to see them. But uh, even with light bodied wines, you'll also, if you tilt your glass of wine slightly, you'll likely be able to see uh, some form of your fingers through the wine. So it's pretty translucent. I think that's a characteristic that a lot of light-bodied wines have in common. Another thing is that when you swirl the wine around, notice how freely it's moving and how it's not kind of sticking to the glass at all. Um, that's another uh, common element in light-bodied wines. Basically, there's less solids inside of the wine, so there's less uh, particles to stick to the edge of the glass. Now, compare that to my example for a very full-bodied heavy wine. Uh, in this case, it's milk. Now, when I swirl it around, notice how all of these particles are stuck to the glass at the end. Notice how it's much slower in moving about because it is a heavier substance that has more viscosity. Now, if I tilt the milk down, I can't see anything through it because there's so many dissolved solids into the liquid. So I can't see my fingers whatsoever. Um, so it's totally opaque. Now, this is gonna be similar in a lot of wines as well. Usually these very heavy, full-bodied wines, when you tilt your glass down, you won't be able to see anything at all through it. So those are a couple easy tools to, um, to kind of help you decipher whether your wine is light, medium, or full-bodied. Basically, the closer to the milk it is, the more similar to full-bodied. The closer to the water it is, the more similar it is to light-bodied. If it's somewhere in between, you can just call it medium-bodied. Now, the next component that goes into any bottle of wine is the alcohol content. You know, the entire reason we drink wine in the first place, to get drunk. But, on a serious note, uh, the alcohol content is absolutely the easiest one of all to understand and the easiest one to know because you can just pick up your bottle of wine, look at the label, you can find out the alcohol content. Boom. Right there. So, obviously, that's... Um, you know, that's one way to do it, but there's also various ways to just perceive the alcohol content. Um, in general, talking about alcohol, the main thing is that higher alcohol wines are gonna have a tougher time with certain styles of food, uh, right off the bat, especially with spicy food. A very easy key wine pairing no-no is don't pair very spicy food with very high alcohol wines because they're the, the spiciness is literally going to be amplified by the amount of alcohol and it's going to feel like your tongue's burning off. But that's, that's an aside. Alcohol content, usually related to like this burning sensation that you feel. It's, you know, imagine having a sip of a beer compared to a sip of vodka. It's a big difference. 
So the higher out the alcohol is, the closer it's gonna have that kind of warming sensation in, in, your, in your chest, in your throat. Uh, whereas lower alcohol wines are a little bit easier drinking. You don't get quite as much of that sensation. All right, now onto uh, the fourth component. And in my opinion, probably the most important component of all is the acidity in the wine. Now acidity kind of sounds like a, not that great of a word, but it's absolutely vital in, a, in all sorts of wines. And basically the acidity is the sensation that you get on the side of your tongue and the sides of your cheek that when you take a small sip of the wine uh, your, your mouth starts watering and the side of your tongue starts watering and your cheeks start watering uh, that sensation is the acidity you know a uh, easy way to to describe it is go in and slice a lemon open and and take a small bite out of it and see what happens to your mouth you're going to instantly start it's like this puckering sensation it's obviously sour but your mouth starts watering and you want to take a sip of water so Acidity in the wine is kind of the, the same concept. You take a small sip, it makes you your mouth water, it makes you want to have another sip. And basically, the higher the acidity, the more extreme those effects are. Uh, if you have a glass of a super high acid wine, you take a small sip, your mouth's going to be watering, it's going to be, it, it's really going to be enticing you to have another sip. Whereas wines that are a little bit uh, lower acidity, they don't quite have that sensation quite as much. So this is probably the hardest one to calibrate to understand that, let's say this wine is high acidity and this wine is medium acidity. That's something that's going to come with time, uh, the more that you taste. But uh, yeah, now there's a key uh, relationship between two of these components, and that's the acidity and the alcohol content. Now, usually those two are inversely correlated. That is that usually when alcohol content is high, the acidity is gonna be on the lower end. And if the acidity is high, the alcohol content is gonna be on the lower end. And there's a really great reason for this that makes total sense. And it, it, it has a little bit of science, but bear with me, because this is important. It's really gonna help your understanding of wine as a whole. So basically, think of a, any sort of grape. The, if you have a grape that's super underripe, that is, you know, you go to the store, it's not fully ripened, it's not sweet, what does it taste like? It's sour, it has high in acid. Um, so, you know, in table grapes, we don't really want that. Um, conversely, if you, if you eat a grape that's super, super sweet, it has none of that tartness, it has none of that sourness to it. And that same concept is gonna apply in the wines. Basically, if you go somewhere super warm, let's say Australia or California, those grapes have so much sunlight that uh, they're always ripening fully. So there's a ton of sugar in the grape, and because of that, there's not that much acid. So when you take those grapes and you turn them uh, into wine, all the sugar simply becomes alcohol. The, the yeast that makes wine, the yeast eats the sugar, and it turns it into alcohol. And because there was so much sugar present in that grape, there's not that much acid. So that's why the alcohol content's high, because that's where the sugar came from, and then the acidity is low. Now, if you take the inverse example, you go to a cold region. Let's say, let's say you go to Burgundy in France. It's a pretty classic cool climate region. There's not that much sunlight. So the grapes don't have quite as much sugar in relation to, a, a, let's say, Australia or California. So because of the fact that there's not as much sugar in those grapes, their acidity in the grapes is a little bit higher, or quite a bit higher, than the acidity found in grapes from other parts of the world. So because of that, when you turn those grapes into wine, that sugar content is being turned into alcohol, which is not gonna be as high as other parts of the world, and then the acidity there is a little bit higher. So that's why higher acid wines are naturally a little bit lower in alcohol. And it's because of the same the, that concept in grapes. There's an inverse correlation. You can't have a super tart and sweet grape. You either have a tart grape that doesn't have a lot of sugar in it, or you have a sweet grape that has a lot of sugar in it. And so those types of grapes are what goes into making the wine, and that's why wine follows the same concept. You either have a high alcohol wine with low acidity, or you have a high acidity wine with low alcohol. Now, a couple, there's some exceptions, just like everything in life, but for the overwhelming majority of the wines you taste are gonna follow that rule. All right, now onto the last aspect of the structure of the wine, and that's tannin. And just uh, to make things really simple, in general, 
when people talk about tannins, it's exclusively gonna be for red wine. Especially when you're beginning, there's no need to worry about tannin and white wine whatsoever. So let's just get that off. Tannin, at this stage in our wine career, only gonna be in red wine. And the tannin is, um, it's a pretty unique sensation. I would uh, compare it to if you've ever had really strong unsweetened iced tea, like black tea. Um, tannin is a compound that's found in the skin of the grape. It's also found in tea leaves. It's found in oak, in oak barrels. So it's this uh, kind of drying out sensation, this kind of astringency uh, that's found in, you know, when you take a sip of a very tannic wine, it's this bitterness um, and it's almost like a coating sensation that coats your teeth, um, it coats your gums. It's kind of this puckering, drying out sensation. So um, that's the easiest way to, to describe it. A very tannic, heavy, full-bodied red wine like a Cabernet is gonna be high in tannins. Uh, Barolo is one of the classic, very high tannin wines. Uh, if you're still not exactly sure with what it is, go and, go and have a very strong tea, uh, black tea uh, in particular, and you'll, you'll see a similar sort of drying out sensation. That's the tannin present. That's that. So those are the five structural components of wine, and they're super important because every single wine has all of these components in them. So if you can really take some time and try to do your best in understanding these concepts, you're gonna have way more fun choosing your own wine and drinking wine because you're gonna know what to expect. So my, my suggestion is side by side some wines and actually think about these concepts at play. If you can try two Chardonnays from different parts of the world next to each other, try maybe like a, a American Chardonnay versus a French Chardonnay, no, try to see which one has higher acid. Try to see which one is typically a little higher in alcohol. Um, usually you're gonna see these things are gonna make sense. You're gonna see that the colder region, France, is gonna have the higher acid and it's gonna be felt by those things I told you. It's gonna be a little bit more of a watering sensation. The American one is gonna usually have a little bit higher alcohol content because it's warmer there. So when you start seeing those patterns hold true, wine gets a lot more fun because everything starts making sense. And, um, and that's, that's the best is when things make sense, you know? So uh, stick around every week, we're throwing up a new video um, and drop me a follow, drop me a subscribe, do whatever. Thanks for watching guys and uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers.